This is Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm speaking to you today from one of my favorite buildings to which I still come now and then to work. It is the United Nations headquarters, New York. I shall be joined today by some interesting people, warm-hearted people, who feel as I do about United Nations Day 1959. They are Doris Day, Joseph Schulkraut, and Gregory Peck. Since 1946, when I attended the first session of the United Nations General Assembly in London, I can think of no project that pleases me more, that is more humanitarian than the United Nations World Refugee Year. On United Nations Day in 1959, we wish to tell you a little about World Refugee Year, which began in June. By 1960, thanks to the cooperation of United Nations member countries, we hope to close all refugee camps, those frightful places which I have seen, which still exist in Europe 14 years after the war. There's more to be done, certainly, but this is a very big start indeed. On UN Day, when many of us pause to think about what the UN is, what it means, and what it does, I want you to hear a story. Though it has music and a very pretty and charming actress to tell it, I assure you it is quite true. The actress is a favorite of mine, Miss Doris Day. But before Miss Day begins, I want you to remember one thing. It is a very difficult thing to be a child growing up in a refugee camp. All that is normal and natural to the young is lacking. You learn to make do, to adjust, but you have no hope, no plan, no dream. One of the reasons I'm so interested in the UN's World Refugee Year program is because thousands of children will be able to dream again. Having said this, I invite you to hear Miss Day in Life Begins at Ten. He was ten years old, and for ten years he lived in a refugee camp. In fact, he was born in a refugee camp. Actually, he had known a number of camps, four of them to be exact. For the past three and a half years, little Janos had been living in the camp at Latina, which is south of Rome on the road to Naples. This camp is set almost in the middle of the town of Latina. And if you walk along the main street, you are likely to hear three or four Eastern European tongues blending in with Italian. Janos and his mother shared a room at the camp. The father had died five years before. Three years later, Janusz's mother first thought of emigrating to a new country. She spoke with officials from the camp, the voluntary agencies, and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. But time was going by, and Janusz was growing from a baby into a fine big boy. He was a quiet and sensitive child who never complained. Like so many other children who lived in refugee camps, he had learned to adjust himself to many limitations. One day, Janusz's mother was called to the camp office, where the UN representative told her that through a voluntary agency, a sponsor had been found, that she and her son would soon be able to leave the camp. As the woman's eyes opened wide, almost in disbelief, the UN man continued, they were going to America, and there would be a home for her and Janos, also a job. Here was the realization of an almost abandoned hope. The UN man continued. There wasn't much time. In fact, she and Janos would be leaving within five days. They would fly with other refugees on a plane specially chartered by the Intergovernmental Committee for European Migration, which helps to find resettlement opportunities for refugees. After more than 10 long years in refugee camps, this promise of a new life was almost too much to bear. Janos's mother hurried to tell her son the wonderful news, but when she did, she was bewildered by Janos's reaction. America is a very long way from here, he said. Will we like it in America, mother? Everything is so, so different. 
Oh, I'm sure we will, his mother answered. You will go to school, and I will work hard for both of us. She paused and looked at him. You don't seem very excited, she said. Perhaps Janosch's mother couldn't quite realize that even a child, after an entire lifetime spent in a refugee camp, might have defensively retreated from harsh reality into resignation. On the morning Janos and his mother were to leave, a camp official said to the boy, Do you know what today is, Janos? Yes, it is my birthday, Janos said. Today I am ten. Your birthday? Why, you should have a party. With a pathetic shrug, Janos said, I've never had a party. That night, Janos and his mother and the other refugees were at the in-transit lounge at Rome's Chiampino Airport. Finally, a voice came over the speaker. Migration Committee Special Flight for New York. Please board the aircraft. Migration Committee Special Flight for New York. Please board the aircraft. When the plane was several hours out, the UN official accompanying the group asked Janos, do you know what day this is? It is my birthday, came the reply. The official gave a signal. A smiling stewardess walked down the aisle with her hands held high. She was carrying a small birthday cake with barely room for 10 lighted candles. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Janos. Happy birthday to you. And so, at 15,000 feet over the Atlantic, for the first time in his life, Janos had a birthday party. The voices that sang the familiar music came forth in a half dozen languages. But it made no difference. Janos understood. In a moment, we are going to hear the voice of another famous singer in a refugee camp in Europe. It is no guest appearance, for this lady lives there. She is a refugee. One of the 14 million throughout the world dependent on the United Nations for at least a part of their subsistence. A man consists of a body, a soul, and a passport. Sir John Hope Simpson of England, a man familiar with refugee problems, said that. And sometimes the passport is the most elusive. To focus attention on the problems of the refugee, step by step to alleviate the problems, that's what World Refugee Year is all about. The singer in the camp is an example. I have asked my good friend and the celebrated actor, Mr. Joseph Schilkraut, to tell us about it. The bitterest of all the legacies of war and political upheaval, the problem of the refugees. This singer you're listening to, she has a history. And there was a time when audiences in one of Europe's great opera houses applauded her. She has not been inside an opera house for some years. Nobody applauded her after that song just now. She sang it and we recorded it in a tiny room with a concrete floor in a refugee camp in Trieste. She lives there as a refugee. What is it like? after you've sought refuge in a territory other than that in which you formerly resided. Some, a few, are lucky. 
But for most, for thousands and thousands, it means a long, slow process of waiting, of waiting in a camp for a piece of paper, a visa, which means you can move on to a new, productive life. Ask any of those you see how their plans are getting on or when they expect to move on, to emigrate to a new land, Canada, America, Australia, Brazil. I haven't got my visa yet, but I'm waiting for it. You're waiting for it? How long have you been waiting for your visa? Well, I've been waiting long? here for about four years. Four years. And what makes you think that your visa will be coming soon? Oh, that's a hope. Everybody's waiting so long for it. They wait. They wait for a visa. That means there's someone in a foreign land willing to sponsor them, that there'll be work and a home. And while they wait, what can they do? Get sporadic and unrewarding jobs in the vicinity of the camp, washing dishes, perhaps? But what about the hours of darkness when despair swells up inside like a choking fog? The slow erosion of passing time is probably the greatest obstacle, but it's certainly not the only one. The rules of immigration are demanding things. You may not have the required skills. You may be too old at 45. You may just be ill. So what is being done to provide a real chance? The answer, fortunately, is a great deal. By the High Commissioner's Office, by non-governmental organizations, and by individuals in many countries who have responded to the challenge spontaneously, not just with sympathy, no, but with active, practical work. This was recognized when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for the ceaseless effort it is making to find a permanent solution. Yes, the solution of the refugee problem can make a contribution to world peace. Mr. Schilkraut has stated it well, I think. Now, what can we do to help? Sixty nations have coordinated their efforts through the United Nations and World Refugee Year. What can we as individuals do? I should like now to call on Mr. Gregory Peck in Hollywood. You know what it means to be forgotten? The United Nations General Assembly has declared this World Refugee Year to speed up the rehabilitation of these forgotten men, women, and children. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees urges your support of this vital mission. The President of the United States has issued a special proclamation on behalf of the refugee. The United States Committee for Refugees says, help us help the refugee. The earth is one. There is no place that is good when elsewhere in the world the destitute cry for our attention. When 14 years after the war there are still homeless, unwanted refugees. What is it then but a blot on the conscience of all of mankind? During World Refugee Year we have an opportunity, each of us, to remove this blemish from the conscience of mankind. On United Nations Day, 1959, you have heard Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, Miss Doris Day, Mr. Joseph Schildkraut, Mr. Gregory Peck. This program was brought to you by the United States Committee for the United Nations and came to you from UN Headquarters in New York.